Hi everyone, and welcome back to Ways of the World, a brief global history with sources. We're going to conclude our study of milestones of the past century, war and revolution, with a Second World War, 1937 to 1945. The road to war in Asia. So Japanese imperial ambitions arose in the 1920s and 1930s. Japan had acquired influence in Manchuria after the Russo-Japanese War of 1905, or excuse me, 1904-1905. In 1931, Japanese military units seized control of Manchuria. Western criticism led to Japan withdrawing from the League of Nations. By 1936, Japan was more closely aligned with Germany and Italy. Now, in 1937, there was a major attack on the Chinese heartland that started World War II in Asia. International opinion was against Japan, and the Japanese felt threatened. And there's a growing belief that Western racism was in the way of Japan, being accepted as an equal power. And Japan was heavily dependent on foreign strategic goods, especially from the United States. And imperialist powers controlled the resources of Southeast Asia, and the Soviet Union, with its communist ideology, loomed large in Northern Asia. In 1940 to 1941, Japan launched a conquest of European colonies, particularly in Indochina, Malaya, Burma, Indonesia, and the Philippines. They presented themselves as liberators of their fellow Asians, but the reality was highly brutal rule by the Japanese. And in December of 1941, they attacked the U.S. uh, base at Pearl Harbor. And Pearl Harbor joined the Asian and European theaters of war into a single global struggle. Okay, uh, World War II in Asia and the Pacific. So Japanese aggression temporarily dislodged the British, French, Dutch, and Americans from their colonial possessions in Asia, while inflicting vast devastation on China. Much of the American counterattack involved quote-unquote island hopping, across the Pacific until the dropping of the atomic bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki finally prompted the Japanese surrender in August of 1945. So now let's look at this map, uh, World War II in Europe and Africa. So for a brief moment during World War II, Nazi Germany came close to bringing all of Europe and North Africa under its rule. Then in late 1942, the Allies began a series of counterattacks that led to German surrender in May 1945. So when you compare the two maps, World War II in Asia and the Pacific, and World War II in Europe and Africa, let's see if we can get both of these on the screen here, or at least some of them. Right, Uh, when you compare those two, how are Allied strategies fundamentally different in the Pacific than in the Europe, than in Europe. So how are allied strategies different in the Pacific than they are in Europe? Well, when compared to Europe, allied strategy in the Pacific was heavily reliant on American forces, involved much more naval power, and sought to quote-unquote island hop toward the enemy, uh, particularly Japan. All right, the road to war in Europe. So Nazis promised to rectify the injustices of Versailles. At first, Britain, France, and the USSR were unwilling to confront German aggression. And war was perhaps actually desired by the Nazi leadership. Hitler stressed the need for, quote-unquote, living space in Eastern Europe. And they began to rearm in 1935. By 1938, the annexation of Austria and the German-speaking parts of Czechoslovakia had shown that Hitler, Hitler... was on the aggression or on the uh, aggressive path. In 1939, uh, there's the attack on Poland, and that triggered World War II in Europe. Now, Germany's new tac- tactic of Blitzkrieg was initially very successful, but Germany quickly gained control of most of Europe with this new um, tactic, bl- Blitzkrieg. There's a rapid defeat of France, the air war against Britain. An invasion of the USSR. But Germany was stopped by the Soviet counterattack in 1942, and the Germans were finally defeated in May of 1945. Alright, so let's go back to our World War II in uh, Europe and Africa map. So remember I told you that Nazi Germany came close to bringing all of Europe and parts of North Africa under its control. Um, 
But in 1942, the Allies began counterattacking, and that led to the German surrender in 1945. So according to this map, which nation took the most territory from Nazi Germany in the final two years of the war? The massive Soviet pushback after Stalingrad meant that the Russians took the most territory from the Germans after 1943. All right, consequences, the outcomes of a second global conflict. So an estimated 60 million people died in World War II. More than half of the casualties were civilians. Mm -hmm. So the line between civilian and military targets was significantly blurred and non-existent by the end of World War II. The USSR suffered more than 40% of the total number of deaths. China also suffered massive attacks against civilians. In many villages, every person and animal was killed. In the rape of Nanjing in 1937 to 1938, 200,000 to about 300,000 Chinese civilians were killed. Countless numbers of women were sexually assaulted. Now, the bombing raids on Britain, Japan, and Germany showed the new attitude toward total war. Governments um, were uh, mobilized for economies. People and propaganda reached further than ever before. All right, a mother and child victims of Hiroshima on the floor of a makeshift hospital two months after the attack. Quote, if the radiance of a thousand suns were to burst at once into the sky, that would be the splendor of the mighty one, end quote. This passage from the Bhagavad Gita, an ancient Hindu sacred text, occurred uh, to J. Robert Oppenheimer, a leading scientist behind the American push to create a nuclear bomb as he watched the first successful test of a nuclear weapon in the desert south of Santa Fe, New Mexico, on the evening of July 16, 1945. Years later, he recalled that another verse from the same sacred text also entered his mind. Quote, I am become death, the destroyer of worlds, end quote. So the atomic age was born amid Oppenheimer's thoughts of divine splendor and divine destruction. Several weeks later, the whole world became aware of this new era when American forces destroyed the Japanese cities of Hiroshima and Nagasaki with nuclear bombs. The U.S. government decided to use this power um, with this new weapon, partic uh, particularly to hasten, excuse me, hasten the end of World War II, but also to strengthen the United States' position in relation to the Soviet Union in the post-war world. Whether the bomb was necessary to force Japan to surrender is a question of some historical debate. What is not in dispute was the horrific destruction and human suffering wrought by the two bombs. The centers of both cities were flattened and as many as 80,000 inhabitants of Hiroshima and 40,000 of Nagasaki perished almost instantly from the force and intense heat of the explosions. The harrowing accounts of survivors offer some sense of the suffering that followed. A schoolboy in Hiroshima who lived through the attack recalled, quote, old people pleading for war tiny children seeking help, students unconsciously calling for their parents, end quote. And remembered that, quote, there was a mother prostrate on the ground, moaning with pain, but with one arm still tightly embracing her dead baby, end quote. But for many of these survivors, the suffering had only begun. It is estimated that by 1950, as many as 200,000 additional victims had succumbed to their injuries, especially burns and the terrible effects of radiation. Cancer and genetic de uh, deformations caused by exposure to radiation continue to affect survivors and their descendants today. Human suffering on a massive scale was a defining feature of total war during the first half of the 20th century. In this sense, the atomic bomb was just the latest development in arms race that drew on advances in manufacturing, technology, and science to create ever more horrific weapons of mass destruction. But no other weapon from that period was as revolutionary as the atomic bomb, which made use of recent discoveries in theoretical physics to harness the fundamental forces of the universe for war. The subsequent development of those weapons has cast an enormous shadow on the world ever since. That shadow lay in a capacity for destruction previously associated with only an apocalypse of divine origin. Now human beings have acquired that capacity. A single bomb in a single instant can obliterate any major city in the world, and the detonation of even a small fraction of the weapons in existence today would reduce much of the world to a radioactive rubble and social chaos. The destructive power of nuclear weapons has led responsible scientists to contemplate the possible extinction of our species by our own hands.
It's hardly surprising that the ongoing threat of nuclear wars led many survivors of the Hiroshima and Nagasaki bombings to push for a world free of nuclear weapons by highlighting the human suffering that they cause. In a speech to the United Nations Special Session on Disarmament in 1982, Senji Yamaguchi, a survivor of, Na of the Nagasaki bombing, pleaded, quote, please look closely at my burnt face and hands. We atomic bomb survivors are calling out. I continue calling out as long as I'm alive. No more Hiroshima, no more Nagasaki, no more war, no more victims of nuclear attacks, end quote. All right, consequences uh, of the outcomes of the second global conflict continued. So let's talk about women in war. There are huge numbers of women that worked in industry and served in militaries. There's also widespread rape. The Holocaust, um, with this event, there are some approximately 6 million Jews that were killed in an attempted genocide. Millions of others were also murdered in camps. And the legacy of the Holocaust really led to a questioning of Western values, the migration of European Jews to Israel, and the new crime of genocide. World War II left Europe impoverished, with its industrial infrastructure in ruins, and millions of peoples homeless or displaced. And it really weakened Europe uh, as they could not hold on to their Asian and African colonies. Communist Consolidation and Expansion the Chinese Revolution. Now, the Soviet victory over Germany gave new credibility to the communist regime. Some authorities played up a virtual cult of World War II. And communist parties took power across Eastern Europe. And there's a communist takeover of China in 1949. There's growing internationalism. The creation of the United States in 1945 uh, provided a means for peaceful conflict resolution. There's also the establishment of the World Bank, Bank and the International Monetary Fund in 1945, and the new dominance of the United States as they became a global superpower. All right, Mao Zedong and the Long March. An early member of China's then minuscule Communist Party, Mao rose to a position of dominant leadership during the Long March of 1934-1935 when beleaguered communists from southeastern China trekked to a new base area in the north. This photograph shows Mao on his horse during that epic journey. In what way did World War II contribute to the rise of the Chinese Communist Party? The Japanese invasion of China forced the nationalists into the interior and undermined the nationalist support. The Chinese Communist Party's use of guerrilla warfare allowed them to halt the Japanese advance, winning support in the countryside. And the Chinese Communist Party protected peasants from Japanese atrocities. Finally, the communists promoted education, women's rights, and economic justice despite wartime exigencies in areas that they controlled. All right, uh, this is Source 21, Italian Fascism, Creating a New Roman Empire, particularly called School Exercise Book Celebrating Italy's Victory Over Ethiopia, 1937. So this source was on the cover of school exercise books. Mussolini appears in the foreground in military uniform, including a combat helmet, while in the background looms a famous national monument commemorating the unification of Italy in 1871. Located near the heart of ancient Rome, this monument uh, used classical architecture and sculptural styles to evoke the revival of Italy's glorious past. The golden-winged figure, busy inscribing the date of the empire's foundation on a tablet, is Victoria, the Roman goddess of victory, widely revered in Roman armies and worshipped by returning generals. The caption reads, quote, In the first year of the foundation of the empire, the Italian people renewed the victorious uh, Deus Mussolini with fervent testimonies of gratitude and devotion, end quote. So why might the artists have chosen to present Mussolini in the context of the ancient Roman Empire? Well, Mussolini saw himself as creating an Italy that was a revival of Rome's glorious past. Thus, the dictator is shown here in the context of classical Rome. And why might Mussolini want to link his recent conquest of Ethiopia with the 19th century reunification of Italy? Such was the tradition of Rome, unification of the Italian peninsula followed by overseas expansion.
All right, this is source 20.3, Nazi anti-Semitism by H. Schluter, um, The Eternal Jew, 1937. How does this image illustrate Hitler's understanding of Jews as expressed in the previous source, uh, Mein Kampf, where Hitler explains the racial problem? Well, like Hitler's expression of the Jew in Mein Kampf, this Nazi depiction of a Jewish man shows him as selfish, dirty, and an advocate of communism. Notice particular aspects of the image, the coins in his right hand, the whip in his left, the map of Russia with the hammer and sickle, the general appearance and dress of the figure. What does each of these suggest about the Nazi case against the Jews? The coins depict the Jew as a moneylender and thus an economic parasite. The whip implies that he intends to make the society in which he lives subservient to his whims. The map of Russia with the hammer and sickle depicts the Jew as an advocate of communism. And the general appearance as unkempt and unshaved implies that he does not conform to German ideals of beauty. So let's analyze the purpose of this image. Consider how specific imagery conveyed particular messages and was used to appeal to specific audiences. This 1937 archetype of the Jew reinforced Nazi stereotypes of him as dirty, parasitic, greedy, and communist. This personification provided a scapegoat to many Germans who were suffering under the economic conditions of the Great Depression, which hit Germany especially hard due to the payments required under the terms of the Versailles Treaty. All right, Japanese imperialism, Japanese propaganda, poster of Manchuria under Japanese occupation, 1933. What con <clears throat> contrast can you identify between the two panels? How does the imagery in both enhance the message of the poster? And what kinds of figures dominate each panel of the image, and what are they doing? Well, the panel at the left depicts demons performing torture in the afterlife, well, the panel at the right depicts angelic fi figures in bliss. The message is that support for the Japanese seizure will lead to eternal bliss, while opposition will bring eternal pain and suffering. How does this portrayal of Japanese empire building compare with that of the Italian imperialism that we saw in Source 20.1? Well, both infer that support for the government will ultimately bring glory, and the emphasis in the Asian image is on individual glory, well, that of the Italian image is on the state, personified by Mussolini. So analyze the purpose of the posters. Specific, or excuse me, specify the probable audiences and the messages that, conveyed, that were conveyed to them. These posters' audience was the Chinese people living in Manchu, Manchukuo. The message is that support for the Japanese seizure will lead to eternal bliss. Like I said, well, uh, opposition will bring eternal pain and suffering. And that concludes our study of a second world war. I will see you guys for next time.